Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode number 61. And if you are watching on YouTube, you can see we have got a special guest here on today's episode. Um, one of the co hosts of the Pick Aside podcast, we've got Joel Dells with us. Joel Dells, how are you feeling today, bro? Feeling good, man. You know, Celtics win a championship. I feel like I feel like I got to go on a tour too. You know, yesterday <laughs> we had we had the Pick Aside show. I was getting all the receipts off, all the bookmarks, all the all the clips that I had saved for really this last week. Ever since Celtics went out three, I was like, yeah, let me just get some ammo ready. Um, but appreciate you having me on, man. Uh, it, it's been a good, been a great, I would say, a couple of days. Yeah, I can imagine you're probably riding a high. And if um if y'all have not um looked at Dell's Twitter, it's definitely worth a quick quick read through because <laughs> he's pulling stuff up from years ago. He kept every single receipt. Which uh look, when, when your team wins a wins a championship, you got you know a, a, all free reign for about a good couple of weeks, month or so. Um, so it's I all, feel it's like all I, I unlocked a new weapon. Like I, I have like, oh, well, he's got a ring. Tatum's got a ring. Brown's got yeah. a ring. Missoula's got a ring. So whenever those debates come up, like, oh, because I, I kind of put out a troll tweet earlier with like my top five list. I had Tatum at three, Luke at four. <laughs> kind of messing around, kind of being serious, you know, just yeah. getting a feeler out there. And just like the two guys you want, whether it's SGA, Luca, Embiid, people want in the top five. I think it's fair. It's like they don't got rings. You know what I mean? Like Tatum yeah. got a ring now. Th- the conversation starts to change. Hey, Tatum said it, bro. What they gonna say now? They gonna let's talk about it. <laughs> oh man. Um, uh, as we usually start um, every single episode, we've been doing quotes of the week. Um, so I have a couple here. Obviously, some stuff centered around the finals. Um, but just gonna run through some of these. Want to get your thoughts on them? Uh, the first one I have is from Ramona Shelburne. Actually, was this morning, I think, um, on ESPN. Um, she reported that Jason Tatum's longtime trainer, Drew Hanlon, has been in Greece training a, quote, new client for most of the mm. finals. Said he'll let you guess who that might be. He flew from Athens to Boston Monday morning just to make game five. So mm. <laughs> it's either, you know, I don't want to make any too many assumptions. The Nassans might be trying to get a little bad. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> did he Achilles or did he get hurt? He did. I forgot that happened. Right? Um, he got injured. Because I saw that, too, and I, I saw everyone saying Thanasis. But I, he's got to be real. Like, I felt like he had a, a major end of the season that kind of the rug. Yeah, uh, no, he, he he definitely got hurt towards the end of the season. But um, all, all jokes People's thoughts on Drew Hanlon's hilarious, too. Like, people think Drew Hanlon, like, ruined Jason Tatum, the, the jump shot because of Drew Hanlon. There is very conflicting opinions on him. Yeah, no, it's... I know he got slandered for a long time because he trains Joel too, right? And B, I think um, so. Yeah, so he he definitely had gotten slandered for a while between the both of them. Um, obviously, having some playoff shortcomings the last couple of seasons. Um, but look, sounds like Giannis is trying to to get a little little couple extra moves to his bag, which uh, he needs is him. always scary for the rest of the league. He does need him. HB um, dot guy. Yeah, <laughs> right. Big big run and dunk guy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge. <laughs> uh, next quote I got is from J.B. Bickerstaff, um, who he praised Luca for playing through the pain during the NBA Finals. And uh, you tell me if this sounds like a direct shot at somebody. Uh, <laughs> he said, quote, this is the guy that was taking shots in his ribs so that he could go out and play, right? He was playing through pain. He wasn't complaining. He was still playing 40 plus minutes trying to go out and get it done. The injury is awfully similar to something that happened on a, on the Cleveland Cavaliers as well. Uh, I'll say that the Luca injury is so funny. I do think up like a hundred percent. To be fair, I don't think anyone's really hundred percent at this point in the season. But he was obviously playing through injury, and I give him credit for that. But I also find it funny that he had the same injury in the Timberwolves series. Nobody cared that he was he was going out producing. They were winning. He was putting up great numbers on great efficiency. Then it comes to Boston. The numbers are still there, counting stat wise, but you saw defensively wasn't as great. Mm-hmm. Officially wasn't as great. The one on one numbers with Jalen Brown are, are not in his favor as well. And now all of a sudden it's an excuse, the injury. Yeah. I know he's playing through it, so I don't want to get on him. But that JB quote definitely feels like maybe a little jab to, uh, to I guess, his, his former player now, Jared Allen. Yeah, that's crazy to say as a, a coach to go on. And like, it looks like this came from uh, an appearance he did on a radio show. 
um, wild to to go that direct with the literal shot in the ribs <laughs> uh, since Jared Allen had the exact same injury that kept him out um, pretty much the entire series uh, against the Boston Celtics. Um, and that's the second time somebody's digged that Jared Allen's injury because his own teammate uh, went on the fans who shows uh, is it Marcus Morris was on the Cavs. I know it was one of the Morris twins. Yeah. Um, went on and said he was, if it was him, he would have, he would have played, um, through the injury. So Uh, tough look. Yeah. Just getting, just getting dogged on, (laughs) um, keeping on with Luca, um, and speaking about the injuries, obviously in the post game press conference, he said that he, um, was not interested in looking to blame the, the injuries for the reason why the Mavericks lost. He said, quote, it doesn't matter if I was hurt or how much I was hurt. I was out there trying to play, but I didn't do enough. Um, I say I was fair. I think that's definitely a, a fair assessment because you made a good point. Like he's been dealing with these injuries the entire playoffs. Obviously, they're going to continue to nag and, and, and get worse. No one's going to be 100 percent. I think it's fair to say he probably was definitely labored. You can see it throughout the entire playoffs and especially at points in the series. But at the end of the day, if you're on the court, you're on the court. And we can only you know, judge and criticize based on, you know, what you put out there. And the injury, there's a lot more to blame on why the Mavericks lost this series than Luca not being a hundred percent. And there's stuff that Luca did outside of being hurt um, that contributed to that. Yeah. Luca was a hundred percent. I don't know if that changes the outcome of the series. Like does it go to game six, potentially like one of those games in the fourth quarter. Like there was two this series uh, when the Celtics end up winning where it's a game in the fourth quarter. Like it's under 10 points. There's if the Mavericks make a quick run, they could win the game. So if Luke is hundred percent, does he take one of those games? I think that's possible, but I don't think it changes the outcome of the series. I like that. He takes accountability because I think the worst thing he could have done lose for losing the fashion. They did not really showing up. I've fouling out in game three and kind of, team down and then go up to the podium and being like well you know i was banged up so that's the reason why this happened so i think i'm not surprised i don't think luca really has ever made injury excuses in the past it's more so just the media have been making that excuse for him yeah and uh 100 I, I agree i think the accountability is good because there are some players who i think you would see try to dodge it around it or, or try to use it as an excuse so the fact that he took it head on and was like look it's not the injuries that contributed to that. It's always going to be a good look. And, um, you know, me and Dame recorded that just throughout this entire playoffs, like it's kind of come up in various different cases. One of the biggest ones, obviously, is when it happened to Anthony Edwards and even a guy like SGA. It's like it's hard to be somebody who on their first deep playoff run wins it all. You yeah. almost always see you get so close to conference finals or even a finals appearance and you have to almost go through that loss to really understand. And one of the biggest things that I saw, and we can kind of really transition this into talking about the finals as a whole, um, this entire postseason run, I felt that it was so evident from the Celtics team as a whole, but really between Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, you could see almost like their commitment and effort level rose even higher than we've seen um, in playoff runs in the past. And I think, again, a lot of that just has to do with the fact that they've gotten so close so many times. They've made it to the finals and lost. So being able to get back on that stage, they know exactly what it takes, and they know the pain that it would feel like to lose. Um, and they really allowed that to fuel them. Um, you brought it up earlier. Jalen Brown's defense on Luka this series I thought was fantastic. I think he has as good an argument. Um, to say that he had the best defensive impact on the Celtics um, in this entire series. I probably would put Drew slightly ahead of him, but and that's not, it's not even a knock to Jalen Brown. We all know Drew Holiday is one of the best defenders in the NBA. Um, but Jalen Brown was um, fantastic this entire playoffs, and I thought his effort on that side of the ball was great. Um, I want to start there um, because obviously he ends up winning finals MVP. I want to start by what your thoughts are with that decision I've seen – Obviously, there's going to be discourse around it, no matter who would have won it on the Celtics because their roster is so balanced. Um, I want to know, A, do you think that was the right decision? Um, And B, do you even really think it matters? No, uh, I'll answer B first. It does not matter (laughs) at all. For someone that has just wanted to see a championship, I did not care who won it. It could have been Drew Holiday. It could have been Derek White. As long as you win the championship, you're cemented. You know, you're eternal. You won the championship. No one can really take that away from you. And I I do think it was probably the right move between him and Jason Tatum. I think he had 
higher highs in this series, especially guarding Luca. I mean, I have the numbers here. He guarded Luca on 154 possessions, which ended up being 32 minutes of matchup time, which is just insane. Held him to 21 points, 40% from the field, 25% from three, five turnovers, and only fouled him two times. So if you look at the offensive numbers, it is pretty similar between the two. Tatum had some more assists, more rebounds. It's going to look more whole because I do think he's still a more well-rounded player, especially on the offensive side. But defensively, I look at both of these players, Tatum and Brown, had huge impacts just in different ways. I think Jalen Brown shut down Luka Doncic or as good as you can. I mean, these are phenomenal mm -hmm. numbers. And Jason Tatum kind of shut down everything else they want to do off Luka Doncic. We saw a ton in that series against the Timberwolves where – High pick and roll with Luka. You bring up the five man, Rudy Gobert. He gets into action. Now we got lobs going. Since Tatum is able to guard five, since he's 6'9, 6'10, he's 230, he could rebound. He's our best rebounder on the team. That kind of shuts down a lot of what the Dallas Mavericks want to do. Now they have to set screens with PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr., who, one, are not nearly as good screen setters as Daniel Gafford or Derek Lively. Two, they're not really good three point shooters above the break. So mm -hmm. those corner threes aren't as available. And number three, if they do want to attack downhill, they're kind of smaller players. It's easier to get in their way if they were to go up for a lob. So I think both of these players had high, high moments on offense and defense. But I do think it means a little bit more when you're going one on one with what a lot of people's best player in the world, if not second best player, and a lot of people's just best offensive player, you could go one-on-one -on -one and shut him down like this. I think that's where you give the nod and say, JB, you got it this time. Yeah, I agree. I, I said even before game five, I thought the only way uh, this finals MVP didn't go to Jalen Brown is if by some miraculous effort, this series ended up going six or seven games and you saw ridiculous performances from Jason Tatum in those games. Um, but I thought Jalen Brown was the most consistent Celtic, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Um, I thought he was the most clutch Celtic in game. Uh, it was a game three um, where, where Luka got ejected and the Celtics offense had really kind of been stale as they had kind of sputtered out and blew that 21 point lead. It was Jalen Brown who kind of calmed them down and hit those clutch shots, you know, worked in the mid range. Um, and those were huge to being able to close out that game and get that three Oh lead, which, we all know continues to be an unbeatable record um, for any team in any playoff series. Uh, but the defense on Luca was fantastic. Like you mentioned, there was times where he's picking him up full court, 94 feet. Um, they had the clip during the, the broadcast where he was mic'd up talking to Joe Missoula. And he was like, look, he better bring the ball up the court. If he wants it, it's like just that dog mentality to say, like you said, take on the challenge to what, you know, a lot of people believe is the best offensive player, in the NBA, I still would not put him as the best player in the NBA. But, you know, discourse is so fast to want to crown somebody new year after year. I don't think that I would put him above Jokic. But he's obviously done more than enough to be deserving of being put in those conversations. And that just goes to show you what a ridiculous talent he is. So, like you said, for, for Jalen Brown to have those type of defensive numbers against the best player in this series, while also being that consistent offensive presence um, for the Celtics. And I think his aggression on getting downhill this entire series was huge. Um, getting to the rim in game one, our Derek lively picked up five fouls and like three of them were all in the third quarter in like a three minute span where it's just Jalen Brown driving into his chest every single time. So he just did so many things um, for the Celtics that were critical to them winning. So um, I, I had it as Jalen Brown, um, the finals MVP for this series, I would have had Tatum right behind. I think drew had a good argument as well. But again, that just goes to show you how complete um, of a roster this was. And, you know, people didn't want to give it its credit really this entire year. And for whatever those excuses are, you know, the East being the weaker conference and they get into the playoffs. And, yeah, they play banged up teams. But I've said it a million times on this podcast. You can only play what's put in front of you. They couldn't make Jimmy Butler be healthy. They couldn't you know, prevent the Knicks from becoming a hospital at the end of that, that series. They only could play who was there. Um, so the, the fact that, and on, on top of that, uh, this is kind of the same argument we saw people may make with Denver last year. They thought that Denver had this easy Mickey Mouse run to a championship. This is kind of what happens when you're the one seed, right? Like you get the easiest path. If you don't want to have or if you want them to play better competition, more teams should try to win more games. At the end of the day, when you're the one seed, that's the reward. You get the easiest path to getting to the finals. 
Um, but I want to I want to kind of pivot even further than to talking about where you think this Celtics team ranks all time. Um, I saw you said that you thought that this was one of the greatest um, Celtics team. I said during the playoffs, I don't think people understand how good this team really is. And I don't know if it'll ever fully be appreciated until, you know, years pass and people really look back. But I think they're probably the best championship team since the 2018 Warriors. Like I would probably take them over every team since then um, because of their historic offense, how ridiculously good and versatile they are on the defensive end. Um, but let's, let's look just specifically in Celtics history. Where do you think this, you know, 2023, 24 team stacks up against some of obviously the great iconic rosters that, that this organization has had over the years. It's so difficult because when you compare these teams, like to other Celtics teams in the past, most of them are, you know, 10 years ago, all of them plus years ago. Point, right so even when you compare them to like uh the big three celtics with rayon paul pierce and kg it's just such a different era and then let alone the fact in like the 80s when you have larry bird and such maxwell and all of these dudes like it's just completely different eras that it's really difficult to kind of pinpoint if these teams matched up who would win because from a math perspective like boston is probably being these 80 celtics teams because they're going to be taking 43s a game yeah. and th that 80 celtics team although they have larry bird and they have all these hall of famers they're just not going to get up as many shots and and over time over a seven game series that's probably going to even out to the 2024 celtics favor so i think in in celtic history i mean in my lifetime i think it's the best team i've ever seen like i really started to become a fan of them i would say around the, that big 3 era so mm -hmm. that team was fantastic a bit forward thinking Thing about like Ray Allen, who was looked at as a um, specialist at that point, where he's coming on to Boston, he knows his role is going to be completely different than it has been in the past. And it's just this Boston team kind of has multiple versions of Ray Allen because everyone can shoot, of course, not maybe as great as him, but there's just so many different parts on this team that they have different ways to attack you with whether it's one-on-one -on -one with Tatum and Jalen Brown, whether it's Derek White who can make a three off the dribble, or he do it green holiday his movement off on kind of the x factor who we didn't see basically the entire playoffs is porzingis if porzingis would have been held through this playoff run i mean they, they could have gone 16 and 0 who knows maybe yeah. 15 <laughs> more like 16 and 1 they they did lose that one game against miami with him so i guess at best 16 and 1 mm -hmm. but that's really the key piece because the celtics did all of this we we're kind of thinking of them in this way and we didn't even see porzingis like we the Dallas Mavericks, in my opinion, in this series, this this five game stretch was the worst uh, from a points per game perspective. It was the worst five game stretch of the Celtics had all season long, and they still won a majority of these games by double digit points. Mm -hmm. So that just showed how locked in this team was defensively. And now you had KP to the mix that, of course, could hit threes. He could post up, attack mismatches around the rim, getting offensive putbacks. It just unlocks a new layer to the team that we really didn't get to see, unfortunately. I think when I go back in just in the last like five to 10 years or so, or at least since we have a new champion, the Warriors, I would put above them. Them in the 2020 Lakers, I think is a real discussion. I think mm -hmm. LeBron and Anthony Davis, they were just both at such a high, high, like probably top five, both of them locked. And then you had just as good of role players with KCP, with Alex Caruso, um, Danny Green, and you had backup bigs like, like Dwight Howard, um, JaVale. Like they just had so much depth and so much, um, like the fit was just so well between right. all of the guys on top of having two top five players. So I think that's a real discussion. But to me, they would be in that top three with the KD Warriors, the 20 Warriors in this 16. Definitely. It's a shame they traded all that away for Russell Westbrook. Um, yeah. uh, like you said, the fit there was so perfect. Um, but I I'm also glad you brought up Porzingis' injury because, again, the biggest – excuse people are trying to make and we even did a live stream right after game five and people were in the chat saying that you know there's gonna have to be an asterisk on this championship everybody they played was hurt nobody wants to bring up the fact that they traded for chris app to be a pivotal part at really like unlocking this missoula ball concept to really having this full you know five out kind of offense he missed most of the playoffs um so you could make the you can put an asterisk you can want to you know say that there's you know, injuries in everybody, every single champion's run. That's a reality of playing sports. People are going to get hurt. 
Things are going to have to break one team's way. Luck plays a factor into winning any sing, any individual championship. Um, so that, that type of argument is always annoying to see because it just feels so degrading for, for no reason. Um, like game one, first quarter, like imagine the Celtics had that for all these like five games. How right. different the series, even though the Celtics won 4-1, how different the series could have really felt because that quarter one with Porzingis, I'm never going to forget. And the Jalen Brown shot in the third quarter, kind of that rainbow mid-range jumper to not seal the game, but give you just a little cushion. I think that brought it up to like a four or five point game with like a minute and a half left. So you just had like a, a second just to breathe because they could not score the basketball. Yep. But that first quarter KP, that was basically what we were getting all season long, right? And then he goes yep. down and it's like, holy shit. I guess they're playing injured teams, but also they're banged up. Like they don't have one of their most important players too. Right. And uh, it, um, I want to also talk about Joe Missoula in all of this because love Joe. Um, yeah, he's a guy who ever since he got the job, obviously going back to last season, you get the job within was like two or three weeks before training camp starts, was not even a top two or three assistant on the coaching staff. Um, this obviously was his first full season as the coach in terms of getting an entire off season to, to really kind of go through um, as the, the head coach there in Boston um, and brings them to the NBA finals, goes 16 and three in the entire postseason, wins an NBA championship, a guy that had had a ton of criticism by not just the people on NBA Twitter, um, but a lot of, you know, media and analysts and talking heads had, real doubts about Joe Missoula's ability to be a coach, um, especially in some high pressure situations. And I think he put a lot of those narratives to bed um, in this entire postseason and especially in the finals. Um, so I, I want to know what, what's your opinion on Joe Missoula right now, obviously coming off of, um, you know, this NBA finals win. I've been a Missoula supporter since day one. Uh, last season, winning more games than we did previously when we went to the finals. The fact that he got the head coaching job two days before training camp opened. He was 34 years old, I believe, when he took over. And you mentioned it. He was in the second row of the coaching staff. He was mm -hmm. not one of the top two or three assistants. This was a guy that Brad Stevens had hired years earlier that he just really believed in as a coach and as a person. So the fact that last season went the way it went, where we went down to Philly, three to two, right? That game six or game five was just so deflating. Like everyone on Twitter was saying, Missoula's got to go, get fired, get fired. Of, co of course, Boston, they win that series. Really the Miami series that pissed me off the most because the Celtics could not hit threes. Al Horford shot 40% from three in the regular. He was at like 20% in that. The open three missed advantage compared. I know everyone's up the Celtics starters three point percentage. Against the Mavs starters, three point percentage like seventeen percent to forty two percent. That was basically the same thing that happened against Miami Heat, where Caleb Martin just can't miss all of a sudden, and Jimmy Butler's hitting threes, and all of their role players are stepping up and making shots, and the Celtics just straight up are, are missing open looks. Like I thought offensively they were playing well and they were missing open looks, and everyone wanted to fire Missoula, and I was like, listen, at the point I was at that time I was like, I don't know if Joe Missoula is going to be a top five coach, he's going to win a championship. Like of course I think this team can do it, but I can't say that for certainty. What I can say with certainty is that Missoula is not the reason we lost the series against Miami Heat. I thought that was on the players more than just getting out schemed or out coached. I thought the players did not play well enough. I thought Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Al Horford, Marcus Smart, nobody played up to their expectation or what we had thought of them, especially coming off a 2022 finals appearance. So the fact that Missoula was able to come into this season with all the criticism he got and I think implement his personality, number one, as mm -hmm. well as kind of the scheme and, and just his his mindset was such a difference that we saw last year. Like you see all these players buying into what he's saying. You hear them talking about like killer whales and the animal kingdom and willing to <laughs> the court. Kind of something that everyone said was lost when Ime left because Ime would scream at you and yell at you and, and call you out in the media. Joe just does that in a different way. His his intensity and his fire just just is just looked a little bit differently because he's putting his arms around players. He's supporting them. And I remember there was one time, I think, I think uh, Tatum like missed a shot or missed a game winning shot. They said, what'd you tell Tatum? He said, I told him I love him. I just think it's very different coaching styles that still we can see both can work out. Ime was fantastic in 2022. 
But two years later, Joe Mazzula, I feel very confident that he is every bit as good as Ime, if not better. Yeah, I, I think that's 100% fair. And I, I, I think it goes to show that teams that are able to be patient with their coaching staff, with their rosters, you will eventually see the, the rewards of that in the long run. We saw that um, obviously last year with Denver. Um, you know, they were, were vocal about, you know, them sticking behind Michael Malone and obviously sticking behind a guy like Jamal Murray, um, who had been dealing with injuries. And, and he thought that maybe at some point that they might have given up on him. And they continued to reassure him that they were fully bought in with him um, as a player in the point guard for their team. And obviously it ends up netting them in the position that they are, obviously being a, a champion and then still being one of the top teams out west in the NBA as a whole. Um, and you can say the exact same thing for a guy like Brad Stevens, who, um, He's even kind of really uh, gone in the media now and talked about he's heard all the noise all these years about you got to break the Jays up. They can't play together. Their play styles are too similar. He heard the noise about Missoula last season that he's not the coach for the Celtics. He's too young and experienced, whatever the case may be. And he just shut it all out and put his trust in his guys the same way that Missoula put his trust in his players. And, and you see the rewards and the benefits of it. Um, and I think too often – we see teams now, it's, it's always such a rush to want to add the next big name. Um, the, obviously, in most recent years, you think of a move like adding in Russell Westbrook or even what Phoenix has done these last couple of seasons going out, where you have a fully fleshed out roster with stars, but you mortgage a lot of that depth to try to go out and get a guy like Kevin Durant. And then you add Bradley Beal into the mix, and then you see you're so top heavy and the stars don't even necessarily mix and mesh in the way that you would like them to on paper. Um, so I, I want to ask you, do you think we're, we're seeing a, a paradigm shift in the way that rosters are going to be constructed in the future, especially when you look at, um, the most recent, I'll say super teams. Cause I don't, do you agree? Would you say the Celtics team is a super team? Uh, I've always said, I've said in the past, no, because I don't yeah. think anyone looks at Jason Tatum, like a bona fide top five just as good as, you know what I mean, anyone else in the league type of player. I feel like to have a suit, you have to have a on sometimes in the Warriors case, two of those dudes. Right. Um, but I also understand depth-wise, like one through five, there's just not a ton of fall-off, and you have dudes that one through five could be the second best player on a lot of teams. Yeah, I, I agree. I When I think of super team, I'm thinking of the Heatles. I'm thinking of the KD Warriors. I'm thinking of what the Brooklyn Nets did when they put KD, Kyrie, and James Harden together. Having a phenomenal starting five with, uh, you know, some of the best role players in the league and you have two, you know, stars, they might not be top tier 1A guys, as people like to say, and Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, but you have your guys with a great supporting cast around them. I don't think that makes them a super team. Um, so I, I want to ask you if, you if you think we're going to see a change, obviously, especially with these two last champions, when you have a team like Denver where you have a guy – um, and just a phenomenal sorting supporting cast that fits. And you go to the Celtics this year where you have just the perfect, uh, you know, roster construction for the way that Joe Mazzulla wants to play basketball. Do you think we'll see teams start to give a little bit more leeway and thought into long-term development and planning and give them a little bit more leashes um, to their roster and their coaches um, to try to, to try to imitate some of what we've seen over the last few years um, and what's been successful at winning championships? Yeah, I think also from just the CBA perspective, you'll probably see some teams try to do that. But if we're being realistic, these teams are still run by humans and they're still run by people. So when they fail or when they spend millions and millions of dollars and they come up short, I still think people are going to be quick to pull the leash on coaches, on players. And although the new CBA changes things, right, like when it comes to trading draft picks, MLE, trade exceptions, all stuff like that, you still have bird rights. So if you're mm -hmm. able to acquire great talent if you're able to whether it's through the draft through free agency on a good deal through a trade like Derek white for example if you're able to acquire those players when they're not making the the super max 40 50 million dollars you can still have those players on your team right like there's going to be some restrictions on how much you can offer like for example boston can only offer i think like 36 or 37 million for Derek white and if a team out there has 50 million dollars in cap space they could offer more than us but for the most part you're still going to be able to retain your talent 
So if you're able to, like Boston did, draft two top-end level dudes in Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, you get Al Horford, who originally was through free agency, but then a trade, Derek White through a trade, Drew Holiday through a trade, Porzingis through a trade, where none of these guys at this point are really viewed at as like top 10 players in the NBA, so they're not making that type of money or it costs that much to even acquire those players. But you're getting them kind of on the low. Like Derek White, two years ago, his trade value has probably skyrocketed since then. Yep. Drew Holiday, we gave up a couple first-round picks for. Of course, Robert Williams as well. And Porzingis, I mean, it was Marcus Martin. We got two first-round two picks back. So the value on all of these players, if you're able to take advantage of that, if you have a GM that can spot talent, can acquire talent, and you're able to develop them, that's the way it's done. It's just very difficult to do. You know, like, that's why there's only one champion. That's why, like, the Celtics, even though they did all of this, it took them, like, six, seven years to finally win that championship. So it's really difficult for owners, for GMs, front office people to kind of sit on your hands and sit there and there was with Jamal Murray, there's with Jalen Brown, that usually that number two guy, you probably have more questions about. Like Jokic, Tatum, we know they're going to be Celtics for life, but there were talks about Jamal Murray, could he get moved, especially after injury? Jalen mm-hmm. Brown, could he get moved, especially uh, since he was due for a $300 million contract? But if you believe in these players and they're hard workers and they're going to level up, like I think we saw Jamal Murray did, like we saw Jalen Brown did, that's the way you build the team and you just put pieces around them. I think what Boston did is still very rare because from a talent perspective, one through six, it's one of the more talented teams we have seen. There's usually a fall off after like two or three and it's like, all right, all-star, all-star, borderline star, maybe kind of role player. This is like all-star, 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 all-star. So it's just going to be very difficult to replicate. Um, but the main reason why is because the first thing you have to do is get those top two level dudes. Jalen yeah. Brown, Jason Tatum, they're not just out there every offseason. They're not available in the draft every season, um, and they're not available in free agency. So you still need to have that top talent to be able to win the championship. Yeah, and on top of that, um, Jalen Brown was a guy who was definitely a little bit more raw coming out of college as well. Sure. Um, like, like Tatum was definitely obviously coming out of the Duke top name guy. Um, obviously able to showcase his talents. Jalen Brown was a, a bit more of a I don't, project might be a little bit too far, but uh, kind of he, he had some development to do. Um, and I, I want to ask you, obviously being a, a Celtics fan and having watched it as these years have progressed, like for him to now be in this position where um, I like to frame the argument as this, because I know what the discourse is around Twitter and the media as a whole. So much of it is about, well, well, maybe Jalen Brown is the better player, or maybe Tatum isn't who we thought he is. And, like, I think that's so – it's unnecessary. I would wish that the conversation would be more about maybe Jalen Brown has just continued to progress to a point where he's even better than we thought he actually was. Um, So I want to ask you, what has impressed you the most about Jalen Brown's development to the point where, again, like I said, he came in a little bit more raw. They weren't sure what the scoring, you know, ceiling would be for him. Um, and now he is, I think, without a doubt, one of the best all around players um, in the NBA because we saw it on display this entire finals, what he was able to do defensively on the ball and as a help defender, what he's able to do as a scorer at all three levels, being aggressive, getting downhill, scoring in the mid range. Um, and then in addition to that, his playmaking, um, obviously Tatum had better numbers, but he's another guy who is just as good at getting two feet in the paint and continuing to make the right pass off of that. Um, so he just is such a well-rounded player. What has impressed you the most about his development to get him to this point where he's now the the finals MVP? I think it's just the consistent growth that's most impressive, right? I think a lot of times when we look at players, we almost expect it to be like 2K, where like at the end of every season, you go up by three. You're an 80, right. an 83, an 86, an 89. But in reality, it doesn't work that way a lot of the time. Like you could have this huge breakout season. The next year you kind of fall off. Then you have a great year and a down year. I think what's been most impressive, regardless of maybe what the numbers say, I feel like the growth has been so consistent really since his breakout year, which in my opinion was the bubble 2019, 2020. I feel like at that moment, that's when I realized like this can be the second best player on a championship team and shit. Maybe the best player, if that's how you really feel finals MVP, I I don't really care. Um, But at that moment on, from 2020 season, I thought he took a big leap. 2021, he got hurt uh, at the end of that season. But 2022 with Ime, I thought he was ever seen three i think the offensively although the defense wasn't as great as on the previous year i think this year was just the best season he's had in the nba 
the 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 combination of the best defender, arguably on the Celtics, especially if you take into account what he did with Luca this year. Offensively, he took a bit of a backseat. Everyone did. We added KP and Drew Holiday, but it was the lowest turnover totals of his season, of his career rather. Um, and then the playmaking jump in this playoffs, I think, was really impressive. Like I know. And I think everyone should know he's not as good of a playmaker as Jason Tatum. But if you look at Jalen Brown, the 2023 Eagles finals against Miami, and you look at Jalen Brown in the finals against the Dallas Mavericks, it almost looks like two completely different players against Miami. He, he damn near could not dribble the ball. Like he would put his head down. He would get doubles thrown at him. The zone would always mess him up. He almost would overthink what he was doing a lot of times. This year was completely different. He felt a lot more relaxed in those moments. I mean, he had the the big play in what was it, the game three or game four against Indy that he middle of the paint. He fought White in the right corner. Derek White hits the three, kills the game for the Boston Celtics. Like he had these moments throughout these playoffs that the playmaking leap has been shown, where he went from a bad playmaker to, in my opinion, probably an average playmaker for a wing of his size, but everything else he brings to the table. So more importantly. I think the fact that he's just gotten better every single year and everything that's basically said that he can't do, whether it's he won't turn into a good shooter coming out of college, because I think you're right. He was very raw. He was really just an athlete or -hmm. whether it was his defensive questions last season or whether it was his playmaking questions because he was never a high assist guy. I feel like every step of the way where he has a weakness, he's able to work on that This season kind of showed all of that come together. Yeah. And people still don't, understand like because they're guys that come in so early like he's there's still room for him to grow like he's not right like he's just now starting to reach what is your athletic prime in the nba so it's like there are years where he's going to continue to improve probably three four five more years of him until he's really like in the you know the exact middle of his prime before you start to see what would be standard regression you know across the the sport so um they are in a, a great position um, as an organization to potentially look to um, come back next year and potentially try to, to repeat as champions. Obviously, we haven't seen a repeat champion since those KD Warriors teams. We've had actually no of the same champions. It was six new champions in the last six seasons yeah. in the NBA. Um, what do you think has to go right for Boston next season to, to look to defend their title and and start what would have to be considered a dynasty at that point if they can go back to back? That's a great question because I think it, it's funny because this run, things went right for Boston. You, there's no way to it, right? Jimmy Butler gets her, Donovan Mitchell, Tyrese Albert, not trying to take anything away from the Celtics run. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of things that can change next season that is kind of reasonable, like the Celtics didn't shoot that great. In the finals outside of game five, where I believe they shot 40%, every every other game was under 40%, and they were around like a 38, 37% team in the regular season. They even had that one game that shot 25% and still won. So if that just kind of gets back to normal, especially for their two stars, Jalen Brown and Tatum, I believe, were both under 30% from three. Maybe J maybe JB was like 32%, but both of them shot well below their average. And then what if Porzingis is just kind of healthy next year? Like, what if right. he's able to play? Instead of in four or five games, what if he's able just to be healthy for the finals or just healthy for the last two rounds of the playoffs? So I almost think it's not what has to go right for Boston. It's just what can they avoid going wrong? Can we just avoid a major injury to Porzingis, to JB, to JT, to any of those top five, six? As long as we have that, I feel pretty confident we'd be able to come out of the East because the Knicks, I just think, have enough firepower as it currently stands. Even if they're able to bring back OG and Hartenstein, I think that'd be a great series. I think that's probably a six, maybe a seven-game series. But I think that's a lot of work on Jalen Brunson. We have to finish the throw at him. Uh, a guy, a, a team like the Milwaukee Bucks, Giannis and Dame, great duo. But I think they have a lot of weaknesses on other points of that roster. Philly needs to fill out an entire roster. They have two players under contract. The Pacers, Magic, Cavs, I just don't know if they have enough to really match up with with Boston. So then you start looking at West. The only team I think they really don't match up great against is going to be the Denver Nuggets, and that's because of Nikola Jokic. And yeah. I don't know if there's a team out there in the NBA outside of the Timberwolves who actually matches up well with that team. And that's just because I don't think we really have a body to show at him. We have bodies for Luka, for Jalen Brunson, for Ant Edwards. Like, we have guys, especially on the perimeter to guard. But asking Al Horford at 38 next year, 39 next year to go and bang with Jokic for 35 <laughs> minutes is a really tall ask. Yeah. So 
I just think Boston has to avoid things going wrong. If they play to just their standard, they have a great chance to go back to back. Agreed. They are in a, a prime position. Um, and I would agree. That's the only team, uh, Denver being that, that I think they don't match up well with. Who's, who's your team, by the way? I actually don't have a favorite NBA uh, team. One of those. Player? Yeah. What do, just cat, just you put on an NBA hat. No, uh, I, so <laughs> I, like I, um, I played football all through high school and college. Um, so I'm a, unfortunately a Cowboys fan. Um, but from the NBA side of things, I got into basketball a little bit later, like around like middle school. Um, and my dad is like a kind of a Rockets fan because I was a Cowboys fan. Dirk ended up just being my favorite player because I would be on 2K and I'm like, oh, Dallas, Dallas. Yeah. I made the connection. Uh, so I have like the mini Dirk jersey up there, but I don't have a, a favorite team. When I was younger. I used to be like, oh, I'm a Celtics fan or a Mavs fan. But like I ne I wouldn't can really consider myself a fan. I really just okay. am a basketball guy. Sure. Um, but no, like I said, I, I think that the – the Nuggets are just a tough match for everybody. And I think it's funny. I was actually um, talking to somebody about this recently. Um, I think that one game against San Antonio where the Nuggets lost late in the season, and that ended up being such a huge determining factor on how the seedings Changes worked everything. out. Right. Because I think the only team out West that I think really can stop Denver from getting to the finals in Minnesota, and they just happen to run into them in the second round. And then, they just don't match up well against Dallas. It just ended up being a perfect storm. That's not to, again, take away from what Dallas is able to do. Like I said, to go on any of these runs, you have to have a little bit of luck. So it kind of just happened to work out that way. But it, it's super interesting and something that I think teams have to keep in the back of their mind if they really are trying to be championship contenders is that there's a very real possibility you're going to run into a seven-foot beast from Serbia. And you, you need to have some yeah. type of, of answer for him. Uh, when that time comes. Um, the last thing I want to talk about on the Celtic side before we kind of talk about, about the Mavericks in the series, um, I really just want to give you the floor to uh, to really defend Tatum because he's caught so <laughs> much, I would say, unwarranted slack or, or, you know, criticism, hate, whatever you want to call it at this point for his performances in the, you know, this playoffs. People saying that he's not really a superstar. He's getting carried, this, that, whatever. Um, just talk about his impact in this series and why he is still a guy. Because I think a lot of people are are trying to get off that train when I, I don't think there's a reason to. I think a lot of people look at this playoff run, specifically the first three rounds, and say anyone could be in Tatum's place and they'd be in the same spot. And I don't really have an argument for that. If you remove Tatum and you put in SGA, you put in LeBron, you put in Luka, you put in really any other top 10 to 15 player in the league, I think that's fair to say Boston still would have ended up in the championship. But I think that has more to do with just the opponents than Jason Tatum. I mean, we've seen Tatum in the past. Just last year, you're down 3-2 against Philly. You come alive in that fourth quarter, game six, you win the game. Game seven, you score 50 points. Come back from down 0-3. The year previous, you go into Milwaukee, and uh, you're down 3-2 on the road. You drop 45, and then you win ECF MVP against the, the Miami Heat at 24 years old. So I think what Tatum has shown in previous years – Although this year, the run wasn't as impressive because they're banged up, and that's what most people's argument is. If you look over Tatum's career, there's not a lot of dudes that does what he's been doing. He's the youngest player, or he has the most points for any player under 27 in the playoffs in NBA history. Like, mm -hmm. he's always winning. He's always in the playoffs. He's always a top two or three seed. And that's the reason why he gets criticized is because a player who's been a top two or three seed for four or five years, you should have a championship. And that's been the biggest criticism. So when I look at other dudes like SGA, when I look at other dudes like Anthony Edwards, like even Luka Doncic at this point, enjoy your time. Enjoy your time where everyone loves Anthony Edwards. Everyone loves SGA because they're new, they're cool, they're just getting onto the scene. What happens if in four years they're 20, for, I guess for Ant, 26, 27 years old, he doesn't have a championship? What happens if he has a couple of number one seeds, but he's not able to get over the hump? I don't think people are going to be saying Ant Edwards is the face of the NBA. Ant Edwards is my favorite player they're going to start turning on him too. Now that everyone has done the same thing with Jason Tatum, I could see that same thing happening in the future. And I think Tatum's biggest weakness is something that is super fixable and something that is due to happen. His jump shot is going to come back. 
Like his biggest weakness was not defense. It's not playmaking. It's not engagement. It's not rebounding. It, it's really nothing outside of his shot starting to fall. So yeah. if you think Jason Tatum is just straight up ass and you think he's going to continue to shoot 30% of his jump shots, which he did during these NBA finals, I, I can't sit here and argue with you because I, I just don't think you have uh, you know, enough intellect to really have this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but if you think he could just somewhat come back to the mean and come back to like a 45% type shooter from the field, 37% shooter from three, now you're looking at a dude that could average 30, 10, 8, which, by the way, is what he did in the Eastern Conference Finals. It's just that Jalen Brown had some higher moments and he got ECF MVP. Mm -hmm. So that's my spiel on Tatum. I still think he's one of the top five players in basketball. And I really just do hope his jump shot could come back because then we, then we could see him average 30 for a playoff run. Anybody at this point who I think – I, first of all, if you come out of the NBA Finals and you think that Jason Tatum is ass, I first of all don't think you watched the finals. Um, I think you looked at box scores and used that to to formulate your opinion. Um, but but like you said, he's just a guy who impacts the game so many different ways. You mentioned it earlier, him being able to almost single hand single handedly in a lot of these games shut down what was looking like the second iteration of Lob City. Uh, between Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford, and he's a wing rebounding with these guys, playing them on the block, trying to stop what had been such an automatic play for Dallas this entire postseason, just easily between Luka and Kyrie, dumping it up there to one of the bigs. Um, to be able to do all of that, obviously had the shooting struggles, um, but his playmaking was phenomenal this entire postseason and in this playoffs as well. Um, he just does so much to impact the game and, and people just, they don't see beyond the fact that he went whatever, two for 10 from three, or, or he shot a, a pad shooting percentage. There's so much more to basketball than that. And like, yes, he has a better team. He has a better roster. Okay. That's, you want to be on a better team with a better roster. Like I think people lose sight of the fact that Jason Tatum does not care. He, I guarantee you, he doesn't care that he didn't win finals MVP. He could care less because he's a champion, and he gets to say that now. Um, and I, I'm happy that both of them, both Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, finally have got that monkey off their back that really been hanging over them for so long that maybe they can't do it. Maybe they'll never be able to, to get it done with the two of them together. Um, and, and I hope it's in a similar way where we saw those conversations start to drum up with Giannis um, prior to him winning one where it felt like that was the constant narrative is is he going to be able to do it is he going to be able to do it and now that he's won one you don't hear that conversation ever again because you yeah. can't make it anymore you can't make that argument so I hope that finally puts that to bed I hope y'all understand that Jason Tatum is one of the best players in the NBA where even if you don't want to put him as high as, as top five you can't deny that he is a star in this league and I'm not going to get into the semantics behind what you think is a superstar because obviously that differs from person to person, but you cannot deny um, how good he is and how much he means to the Celtics team. Cause the Celtics are not as good of a basketball team without Jason Tatum. And there are people who would lead you to believe that that might not be the case. Yeah. And I, I really do think the best years are ahead for the Jays, like getting that monkey mm -hmm. off their back. You just see the way they've been interacting with each other. Like in the past there, there's been so many, so many, you know, discussion points about their relationship because they're both very private people. So yeah. you don't really see them on Instagram hyping each other up. You don't see them out on social media, like just showing love naturally. But the fact that they're doing it so much right now, like deservedly so, you won the finals. You have you have Tatum commenting on, on JB's Instagram um, saying MVP. JB replies back, we both the MVP. You have Tatum posting a picture saying we did it. You have JB commenting saying you're the greatest of all time. Like, it's just shit like that that in like the grand scheme of things, it probably hasn't mattered. But as a Celtics fan, it's just so refreshing to see because everyone just wanted to tear them apart and say they don't like each other and say that there's some sort of tension about who's the guy, who isn't the guy. The fact that I think they both realize at this point, like, screw all of that. If we're both on the same team and we have this roster with a GM, Brad Stevens, and a coach in Joe we could really do some special things here. I, like, it's very rare for players at this caliber, the best players in the, like, they were the best player in their town, their city, their state at one point in time. The fact that they could just put egos to the side 
and not have to worry about I get the ball, you get the ball, I get the last shot, you get the last shot. The fact that they could put that to the side and say we could win rings together is something that you do not see throughout NBA history. I mean, you're looking at like yeah. that's why the Spurs were so dominant for so long because like Tim Duncan didn't have that ego just saying no, Tony Parker, no Manu, no Greg, no Pop. Like, let me do my thing. Like, no, let's come to collective as a team and be able to, you know, really, you know, win a couple championships. Yeah, and that's I'm glad you brought that up too because I know they, they brought it up a ton on the broadcast. And I know that's something that Joe Mazzula and all the players have echoed this entire season is like the, the model of sacrifice. Everyone on this roster had to really sacrifice something because like you said, they're all phenomenal players and each one of them could be a guy or potentially the second best guy on a championship level team. But when they're all in the starting five stuff, you have to sacrifice something. Guys are having to sacrifice shots time on the ball, minutes, whatever the case may be. Um, but everybody put that to the side for the greater goal of winning a championship, and that obviously paid dividends for them. Um, I want to talk about the Mavericks a little bit here, um, and I'll, I'll start with Kyrie because obviously dating back to his time with Brooklyn, he still has yet to win a game um, in Boston I don't know what it is at this point. Um, I don't even want to say that it was just Boston because I just, as a whole, I don't think he had a great series. Um, And I I want to say, based on how I I view it, a lot of that just has to do more with the Celtics defense. Um, You mentioned it earlier. They did such a good job of shutting down a lot of what the Mavericks role players wanted to do. And I think that's always the best way to approach a team that has a guy who's so dominant as a scorer and a passer. because I know that conversation has come up in the past with Jokic, but you have to look at it like this. Jokic or a guy like Luka, they're going to get theirs no matter what you do. Yeah. What you can control is if P.J. Washington is going to get three open looks in the corner. What you can control is those lobs to Derek Lively and Daniel Gaffer. And if you take those away, you can kind of put a stranglehold on the flow of an offense. Um, and in addition to that, Kyrie did not have a ton of easy looks Throughout the course of the series, I think in game one, he missed a lot of, of looks that he probably should have made and would want back, open threes. He missed a lot of uh, drives to the rim, floaters and stuff that, you know, not easy finishes, but for Kyrie, we saw him knocking them down routinely against the Timberwolves, right? Um, so I, I want to start there with what you think about um, Kyrie's performance in this finals um, and if you think there, there's anything really to him not having been able to, to win in Boston since he's left. I mean, it's got to be something. Right? Stomping <laughs> on Lucky, they were, what was he, 0 13 before that game four wins? Got, got to be something there. Because uh, Kyrie, I agree. I don't think he had, a, he had a really bad series, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Game three, he stepped up big. Unfortunately, Luca wasn't able to, to, you know, step up there with him. Game four was solid as well, but that ended up being a blowout. So it just doesn't really hit the same as in like a competitive game. Uh, so you're really looking at like one really dominating Kyrie performance at 35 in that game three, I believe. And the three games in Boston were just terrible. I mean, I agree. Defense plays a big part of it. Drew Holly, you mentioned he was just as, as good as Jalen Brown was on Luka. I thought Drew Holly did just as good of a job on Kyrie Irving. And when they got switches, like guys like Sam Hauser and pa- Peyton Pritchard were even able to hold up their own as well. Xavier Tillman. But there were also just a lot of shots Kyrie was missing, like rhythm shots. Pulling three that this man hit a thousand times that were just so I do feel like a part of it has to be that Boston lore, just like being in the garden, hearing those fans boo you, getting heckled constantly, knowing just in the back of your mind, like, bro, I really haven't won in Boston in like three years. Like I stomped on this damn mascot. I stomped on center court ever since I cannot beat them. Like I feel like naturally it's going to go through your head, even though he'll never admit it. Because as a professional, I just don't think that's something superstitiously you're like you're ever going to admit that, that that bothers you. But right. I feel like it has to play a part because you can't tell me you go home in Game Three in Dallas and all of a sudden you're just you're just eating and everything is great. Um, although the defensive performances I thought were better at home, it's something about playing in Boston. I, I just think that really had an impact on him, especially being in the finals, being in the biggest moment. I believe I, I'm sure something that he believed that he would be able to do in Boston. Now he's kind of playing villain on the opposite. Give credit to us defensively, but there were just a lot of shots, like you said, that we see Kyrie make that for whatever reason just went out in the series. Yeah. But I think that goes back to the defense too. When you are getting harassed by a guy like Drew Holiday, 
when you finally do get those open looks, it doesn't feel as much in rhythm as it it would be otherwise because you ain't seen an open look all game because you just can't find it. Um, I know uh, J.J. Redick talked about it on his podcast with LeBron, um, but there were series – I don't remember who he was talking about, but they they were talking about Kyle Korver, um, and they were saying that they were doing everything in their power to make it hard for him to find a rhythm, top blocking him, whatever it is, so that he just could not get easy looks. So that even the times when he did, there's no rhythm there. He has no flow established. This is like the first open three he's gotten all series. And it's like the first quarter game three. So it's like there's nothing for him to to really build off of. So I think it's definitely probably a combination of the crowd in Boston, the the superstition, whether you believe it or not. It has to just nag at you because, look, 0-13 is is hard to argue with the the stats at that point. Um, and, and the defense as a whole. I'm sure it's a combination of all those things. Um, going to his partner in crime, though, Luca, I, I, we both kind of mentioned. Offensively, he was great all playoffs. His defense, I, I would say, was up and down at times in the playoffs. There were times where it looked like he was really bought in, sliding his feet. We're seeing Luca do things that I've never seen Luca Dunches do on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and then there were times where he's literally just looking like a traffic cone. Guys are just walking past him like a turnstile, definitely up and down, but the Mavericks would not even be close to in this position without what he was able to do offensively. He was relatively consistent for most of the series. He struggled, obviously shooting a ton from the perimeter, especially in games four and five in this one. Um, I want to talk to you first about game three. Um, because I, I, I did a recap video after game three and, and most of what I talked about was about the fact that a, as well as Luca had played without a ton of help from his supporting cast in games one and two, what he did in game three was what I think really sealed the deal, obviously, because no team was able to come back from that type of deficit and him just the entire game, the antics, the, the talking at the refs while the game is going on, there's times where he's really selling calls. He's flopping. He's hitting the ground and Celtics are running in transition and he's not getting back. Then you pick up the fifth foul by running over Jalen Brown. And then knowing you have five fouls in a three point game, why on earth would you ever attempt to take a charge in that position where you know that you are the guy for your team? Um, So talk to me about what you think about well, let's start just in game three specifically. What went through your mind when you saw Luka Doncic foul out um, in a time where they had just cut a 21-point lead down to three on their home floor? Yeah, I, I honestly thought the call was going to get overturned uh, at first because, like, it seemed so bang-bang. And I was like, game three of the NBA Finals, you're at home. Are they really going to call the sixth foul on Luka here? I, so mm-hmm. at first thought, I was like, damn. If this gets overturned, this changes everything, right? Because now JB maybe I think went to the free throw line after that. Luca gets yeah. fouled out. But I really think a lot of the discourse around Luca after game three was more so the combination of game two and game three. Because game two, it ends up being like a seven or eight point game, but they're always in striking distance. Dallas is it's like a six to eight point game basically the entire second half. And Luca really does not show up in the second half of that game. I think he starts mm-hmm. off really well in the first half, first quarter specifically. But the second half just wasn't that same dude, especially in the fourth quarter. He did not shoot well. So I think you had that going for you where it was a winnable game. Boston shoots 25% from three and you fall short, especially on the road. Like if you take that when the series flips on its head, then you have the game three where Boston goes up by 20 points. You go on this 20 to two run. It's right in your grasp. And you pick up four fouls in the fourth quarter. And all of a sudden, your best player gets thrown out of the game. And on top of that, it's the complaining to refs. It's not getting back on defense. It's just basically every complaint anyone has ever had about Luka all in one game. It's the bitching and moaning to the referees. It's not getting back and hustling on defense. It's not showing effort. And it's not, which I don't think to his, his fault, ability to stay in front of guys and just being able to get blown by and constantly have pressure on the rim. And that's when we see Boston kick it out to their shooters in the corners and on the wings. So I think all of that kind of coming and you go down you know, on top of it and it's like the series is over. Luka got a lot of it was maybe a bit overboard. Like some of the stuff Brian Windhorst said, I don't know if I would have gone that far that feels like kind of like you're attacking the person a little bit yeah but i think this series and you mentioned it earlier too that 
your first time going on a deep playoff run, they went to the WCF, so it's not his first time. But your first time yeah. just going to the finals, for example, it's very difficult to win that first time. I mean, LeBron mm-hmm. didn't do it. Tatum, of course, different levels, but he didn't do it. And you kind of need that wake-up call to figure out how to improve other areas of the game. For LeBron, it was like, damn, I need to become more refined offensively. I need yep. to be able to have a more consistent jump shot, especially in the post, too. I feel like his post game improved after that because we knew he was a great athlete. We knew he was a great defender, but offensively, he had some stuff to work on. And I think for Tatum in that 2022 finals, it's my shot's not falling. I have to figure out a different way to impact the game because although he had a ton of assists, he also had a ton of turnovers. It was the most turnovers ever in a playoff run in NBA history. So when you go through those failures, when you come up short, you're able to look back on that series and say, where can I improve on? Where do I have to get better? I think for Luca, it's basically all on the defensive end. You know, if he's able to get a little bit quicker on his feet, if he's able to be more agile, if he's able to stay in front of guys, that would be great. But number one thing he can control, and he did that, I think, a lot in game forward. It's the reason why they were winning so much. Don't complain to the refs. Get back on defense. Mm-hmm. You know, don't get lost off ball. Just stuff that doesn't take physical skill, that's more mental than physical. That's the stuff that you need to clean up 100% of the time because you're already at a disadvantage defensively because you're just not one of the best athletes on the floor any given night. So if you're losing physically and you're losing mentally, that's when we see something like game three happen. Yeah, it it was it was so tough to watch because when I really sat there and thought about it after that game, if he if you could even just take away one or two of those fouls and he finishes out that game, it, there's a very real chance that they can win game three. The crowd had gotten completely back into the game. Something that I mentioned, which is one of the reasons why I picked the Celtics going into this series, was that they have more options to win than the Mavericks do. There, I don't think there's a world where the Mavericks could have won the series if Luka and Kyrie weren't both on fire. You have to almost start with them combining for probably 60-plus points to win a game. We just talked about uh, Jason Tatum getting to the point where he realized if his shot isn't falling, he can rely on his other guys. He can rely on his defense, his playmaking, and they have so many great contributors that him or Jalen Brown don't have to go nuclear for them to win the game. If they do, it's a bonus and a plus, and it probably gets to a blowout. But there's so many different things that or so many different ways that the Celtics can win games. And there's really only one recipe for for Dallas. Um so as soon as he fouls out in game three, it feels like the game is over. And obviously the series is over going down 3-0. But this series is entirely different if they go. They, he doesn't foul out. They find a way to, to come back from down 21, win game three. You get all this momentum going into game four, which they obviously went on to win. I'm not saying that it would be the same type of scenario, but you could be looking at a position where it's a 2-2 series going back to Boston and you defended home court. Instead of now, you got gentlemen swept out of the playoffs. So, like you mentioned, we said already, it's going to have to be a learning experience for him. I I will say to his credit, um, I don't know if I saw him really argue with the ref at all in games four or five. Um, And if it was, it was greatly minimized from how it had been earlier in the series and especially in game three. Um, And I, I hope he realizes that. And this is always my biggest thing with. And not just Luca, really any superstar who is always going at the refs. When have you ever seen a referee in the middle of a play be like, man, Luca, you're right, bro. That was a foul. Hold on. Let me let me fix that. Yeah. If the ref is ever gonna stop the game, he's gonna give you a 10. So what is the benefit in the moment of going at the refs? If you want to do it, you know, during a dead ball, timeout, whatever. I I, I still would prefer you kind of let that be and let your coach handled that, which is how it should be their guys who should be able to talk to the officials. Um, but like I said, I, I hope he uses this as a, a learning experience for him to kind of go forward and understand that you're way too valuable and too critical to this team to put yourself in that position in that moment too. Whether you, even if you, you think it was actually a charge, my, all my football coaches, all my life have always said this, do not ever put the game in the referee's hands. Why would you ever attempt to take a charge as Luka Doncic in a three-point game? Three-point game with four and a half minutes left, too. So if he just lets Jalen Brown go past him, it's now a five-point game with four minutes where you still have all the momentum and the crowd is going crazy and they're they're fully backing you on this comeback. 
Um, so I think as if I was a Maverick fan and, and Maverick fans in general, that's going to be one of the moments that um, they're really going to – is going to leave a bad taste in their mouth when they look back on the series um, because I think it, it goes entirely different if he doesn't, you know, do that in game three. Yeah, I mean, that's – it just shows – I think Missoula talked about this too. Just every possession is so important. Like, you know, because every possession can swing a game and it might seem like one or two plays, but those one or two plays, the series could literally be 2-2 two, two instead of 3-1 or 3-0. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's just so much that goes into every possession that I don't think you quite realize it until you get to the finals and say, if every if we make sure every possession matters, we can leave the court knowing that we tried our best. But when you let a couple go, just one or two baskets changes the outcome of a series. Yeah, and the Celtics were, I would say, throughout the entire series outside of game four where you knew you were going to get the Mavericks' best punch and, you know, all their efforts empty the tank because it's literally they're on the brink of elimination. But the Celtics felt like the team who really understood that and played that every possession really mattered. We see Derek White is missing teeth, literally, <laughs> um, from his effort in this series. And he even said in the postgame he, he'll lose a two to win a championship any day of the week. Um, so they they really bought in to that, you know, the effort that's required to to being a championship basketball team. Um, before we, we really wrap up, you know, talking about the finals, I want to ask you, what do you think the Mavericks do from here? Do you think there's any real changes they need to make? Um, I, I've heard mixed opinions on, you know, what they would need to do moving forward. So I'm interested to hear your take on on where they go from here. I just think they can't be complacent. Uh, I talked about this on Pick a Side yesterday. I think if you look at the last two teams who represent the Eastern Conference, Miami and Boston, when Miami lost last year, there really wasn't any changes to the roster. They brought in Terry Rozier. You make draft picks, of course, but there wasn't really an, any drastic change to the Miami Heat team. And I think you saw, of course, injuries on top of it. But even if Jimmy Butler was healthy, I don't think they go back and definitely not win the championship. Then you have Boston, who two years ago, Ran back the same team, added Malcolm Brogdon, but it was 99% the same team. They failed, and they're like, okay, we have to make drastic changes to this team to win a championship. And they got to the finals. They've been going to ECFs. The, the formula they had was working enough to win, but it wasn't enough to win a championship. And I think Dallas is in a similar situation where it's very easy to sit on your hands this offseason, re-sign Derrick Jones, maybe add a bench piece or potential uh, you know, minor upgrade as a starter, and say, we got to the final here. We have a top player in the world in Luke, the best Rob. It's very easy to do that. But I think if they're serious about trying to win the championship, I think they have to make a not drastic, but I think they need to get a considerable upgrade at the wing position, especially offensively. I think what Derek Jones Jr. did this season was amazing, especially considering what he did uh, on a rookie, not rookie, on a minimum deal, you know, signing late in the in the offseason and being such a huge contributing factor defensively he was great that okay c series he shot really well but i think that's a spot you can upgrade with and you can mm -hmm. make in my opinion the, the the most ideal move which i don't know if is available is a guy like mikhail bridges someone who's shown in the past that you could have him as your number three on a championship team he could lock in defensively and then he could also play with the ball or without the ball because yes. you have Kyrie and luca so someone that gives you an upgrade offensively while still not taking away a lot defensively listen Every team in the in the NBA wants a wing that can guard and can score. So yep. we could say this for every team in the NBA. But I think it's important for Dallas to look at this roster and say, we had a great run, but we just can't sit here and assume we're going to do the same thing again. Because what happens if we run into Denver? What happens if we run into an OKC team next year who just shoots normal and not terrible for a series? And they're going to be a year further along with potentially upgrades in this offseason. So you can't just look at the West and the NBA and say, we're just going to do the same thing again. I do think they need to make at least one pretty decently big move mm -hmm. to get better, uh, get be, just have a better starting five. Agreed. I, I think something that was evident to me in this series um, – Additionally, I think they're missing another connecting piece, whether that's a wing um, or we even see – I was super impressed with Derek Live this entire postseason. He was great. Um, I thought his playmaking as a rookie in this whole run, but even in the finals, was well beyond what I thought it would be coming into his, his first year coming out of Duke. Um, so maybe he takes even more you know, progression on that front. But I think they're, they need – 
another person, and not to be a guy that can relieve additional ball pressure, I think between Kyrie and Luka, they have that pretty much settled. But you need guys who are comfortable with the ball in their hand to be a decision maker. And I think they have what they have currently where it's like you have Derrick Jones, you have P.J. Washington, and you're bringing in a guy like Josh Green or, you know, Maxi Kleba off the bench. And it's like they are not decision makers. They're, if they're catching it, it's 99% of the time it's just to shoot or you're here to, you know, on a cut, drive, whatever. Um, so it's like if they could find another decision maker to add even more fluidity and more make their offense a little bit more dynamic, not even necessarily to say that that ball needs to get out of Lucas' hands as much because I don't think he's as, you know, pound the ball, dribble, 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 we've seen with a guy like Harden at times. Um, but I, I just think obviously having more um, connectors on your offense to get everybody more involved, make it more easier, and even relieve some of the pressure off of Luca to have to always be the guy to find shots um, w- would definitely be a step in the right direction. Then obviously, like you said, if they could find a way to get anybody remotely close to a Mikel Bridges archetype, that would be huge. Um, because to be fair, we saw what they were able to do with not saying that he is at the same level as Mikel Bridges, but a guy like Dorian Finney-Smith who could – not down threes at times, but defensively would get so locked in on that side of the ball. Um, and he was a huge part of them being able to make that deep run to the Western Conference Finals just a few years ago. Um, so it, it would definitely be a, a huge upgrade for the Mavericks and one that I think, like you said, would be needed because they can be complacent in the NBA as a whole. I actually had one of my coworkers ask me this recently. Um, he asked me about the state of, of parity and competition in the NBA. And I said, I really think it's probably in a place where it's better than it's ever been, partially because you have a mix of guys coming in who are younger than ever, more talented at a younger age than ever before. And you could really make a case out West that there are 13 legitimate, like, let's just say good teams. Obviously, there's going to be different tiers. Right. But outside of Utah and Portland, you're going to get Wemby's year two. (laughs) <laughs> like whatever that's going to look like potentially with, you know, two high lottery picks or any trades that San Antonio may make, you're going to get a Rockets team that was already almost a playing team this year. The Warriors are going to obviously have to look to retool, um, but you can't ever count a team with Steph Curry out. The, uh, the Grizzlies are going to be healthy next year. Like the West is going to be absurdly deep. So to your point, you can't afford to just want to run it back because Everybody around you is young and getting better and going to be making moves to try to make that championship push because um, I think something that doesn't necessarily get talked about enough and I think teams are starting to realize is this isn't the same, you know, NBA where it's we got uh, Warriors, Cavs year after year after year. There is a ton of opportunity there to go up and have a year where you are able to go in and win a championship. And so – you're going to have so many more teams that are going to look to be buyers instead of sellers and always look to make that all in move. Um, so you yeah, you're like, to your point, you cannot, cannot be complacent if you're Dallas, but I don't think they need to make any major changes. I was definitely iffy on the the move to go and get a guy like Kyrie when it first happened. Me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I would say I I'm fully on board with that pairing now. Um, you know, after this season. And I think a lot of it obviously has had to do with them retooling the defensive pieces around them. And then obviously both of them buying in a little bit more on the defensive side of the ball. So have to tip your cap to, to Jason Kidd on that front. But, you know, hopefully Nico Harrison out there doesn't, you know, make too many drastic changes to this roster. And just, again, like you said, tries to retool, you know, with a wing um, to, to potentially boost them up and put them in a position where they could, again, continue to compete for finals here because you have a guy like Luca your championship window is open as long as he's on your roster playing like this. Yeah. I I just think the probably one like out, not outlier, but like caveat is Kyrie Irving's just not going to be there forever. Like the Kyrie window is probably like two more seasons after this. And then you're approaching like 35, 36 year old Kyrie. Mm -hmm. And listen, he could still be great. Is he going to be the same level of player we've seen this year? Uh, I guess last year was kind of an off year because he got banged up, but just you probably only have a couple more seasons of Kyrie being at like a great level where he could be the number two next to Luca until like eventually he's going to start falling off um, and not having that same impact. Yeah, no, that's a good point too. Um, so a lot of decisions to be made um, moving forward for the Mavericks. I think this is going to be a very exciting offseason. Obviously, the draft is 
crazy. It's only like a week away now at this point. Yeah. Um, and I saw with the new CBA, like teams can start negotiating contracts like basically immediately. And so obviously you got the, the Siakam extension got announced today um, going back to Indiana. Um, but I think this is going to be a very interesting free agency and just general offseason more so because you've got a lot of big names who might not necessarily be free agents, but are in positions and you have a lot of teams who are either open to potentially moving some of their star guys. Um, and like I said, a lot of teams who are going to be buying names that have floated around like um, Clay, Paul George, even a Darius Garland or Donovan Mitchell. It seems like that pairing in Cleveland may have potentially run its course. Um, so I, I'm expecting a lot of a lot of shakeup this offseason. So I, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, Philly is the most interesting team to me because mm -hmm. Max Loud available and they are they have to add like eight players. Like yeah. it's Embiid <laughs> and it's Maxi, and I don't think they have another player under contract. They might have one player like a player option or team right. option or something, but yeah. I don't think they have anyone else under contract. So who's that third star going to be? And how are you going to fill out the rest of the starting five? And then you need to find five players. They're the most interesting in terms of free agency. For the draft, or it's not the draft, for trades, I'm really interested to see what Orlando does. I think Orlando is the one team in the East that they're still super young. So I don't think they're quite on Boston's level. But they kind of mm -hmm. have that young Timberwolves kind of makeup feel where it's defensive-minded. You have that star in Paolo. Um and they could, they're kind of built because they're so big and long and defensively locked in that they've given Boston trouble in the past, this season and last season, and they're not really ready to compete yet. So if they can right. go and acquire someone that like has a real impact offensively while keeping that defensive identity um, and like physicality, they're a team that could could take a step next year and potentially win a playoff series. Let me ask you this: I've seen people mention this on Twitter, and I think I was listening to number on, numbers on the board, and they brought this up too. Um, how would you feel about a guy like Darius Garland in Orlando slotting in to be their, you know, their lead guard? Garland's, yeah, Garland's been a hot name from damn near everybody. Uh, yeah, I, I do like it. The only piece that you worry about with Garland is just when you have such a great defense, it just kind of pokes a little hole in it. You have ways to, you know, you have going to have backline help, especially if you're able to keep John and Isaac, who is one of the best defenders rim protectors everything and the nba <laughs> this season um so like there's ways to hide it but when you have just such an elite defense it's like i want to find someone who could run this offense and give me a boost offensively but can i do it without taking away that much of my defense and yeah. it's hard because we're talking about guards and there's not a lot of guards who have the offensive firepower while also being a really good defender even even average defender because i think a guy like anthony simons is another player that fits perfectly with what Orlando wants to do. He's going to give you some playmaking, shooting, um, three-level scoring, really. But then yep. again, it's kind of this smaller guard who's going to get picked on defensively. So I think they're in a good spot because they don't have to make a move right now. Like mm -hmm. their window to win is not now. You're still probably a couple years away, like really like three to four years away from being probably a true possible contender just because like Paulo is what, 21 years old, 22 years yeah, old? Like that, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, championships, like you see 26 younger side so they have a lot of time where they can be patient and kind of wait for that perfect player to put next to all of these guys to give a boost to that offense yeah and i we did uh like you know standings predictions before the seasons and i i would say the magic are ahead of schedule i think i had them like I, yeah around like a playing team this year for, for them to be you know will they, will they net out as the the five seed right um going to cleveland um, for them to be in this position, like you said, at such a young age with, with their stars being so young, like there is no rush there. Um, and it, it kind of goes back to the conversation we had earlier, which is like, you just gotta, you just gotta be patient. If, if they don't see anything that they love a fit that, that doesn't work, there's literally no harm in just, you know, letting guys develop. Cause what move could they make right now? It's going to win them a championship. There, there isn't one. The guys are just young. Um, so there's no need to to go all in when there's there's nothing that at stake yet. Um, but but yeah, gonna be a super interesting offseason. I did look up the the Sixers active cap. They have four players currently under contract um, for the next season. Uh, so technically, it's Embiid and Paul Reed, and then uh, Ricky Council and Jeff Dowden. They have uh, Maxi listed as a restricted 
uh, bird yeah, right. He's gonna he's gonna agent. get an extension. But yeah, yeah Paul. 100%. I mean, three players who get minutes under contract. Yeah, you know basically, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they're definitely gonna have to spend the money. You saw him beat on the was it the halftime show? You know, doing the little uh, side eye to Paul George. <laughs> So he's got something to say. He said, yeah, Boston's yeah. not going to be a dynasty because I wasn't healthy. I said, brother, you've been healthy. And we beat you every time. <laughs> oh, we – um after – yeah, last season, um, it was game six where they blew the lead um, against Boston. I had probably like a 15, 20-minute rant up here just on Joel Embiid because um, I, for the life of me, just cannot understand – how he bails teams out late in the fourth quarter where you, all game you're dominant, you're physical, you're in the post backing guys down and then not a single post touch the whole end of the fourth quarter yeah, in a closeout game. And guys, that's on the team. Here, that's on Harden. That's on doc. That's on everybody. Right. I, I I said, I was like, at some point we got to stop blaming doc, even though I think doc in general, like across all of his teams has a lot to take responsibility for. In that specific situation, it's like, man, Doc was a point guard. Doc can't suit up right now and tell Joel, get on the block and feed yeah. him the ball. Like, some point, guys have to figure this out for themselves on the court. Um, but, yeah, to your point, Joel, is, he's had his all opportunities now with multiple different Sixers rosters um, to try to take out the Celtics and has not been able to, to get it done. Um so definitely interested what they're going to do this offseason and how they're going to retool around, you know, him and, and Tyrese Maxey. Um, do you think there's any world Tobias Harris comes back to that roster? Piston. Some team that's good with a ton of cap space. I think the Tobias Harris experiment, uh, I think it's over at this point. Yeah, he was uh, – I could not believe how – it's almost rude to say how useless he felt on the court. Um, it, in it's that, rude, that but series. it's true. Sadly, no, it like genuinely, we, me and you scored the same amount of points as Tobias Harris in a closeout playoff game. Yeah, tough look. <laughs> that, tough look. That, that, cannot <laughs> happen. It's supposed to be your third option. Yeah, they need they need a big upgrade. Yeah, one hundred percent. Last bit of NBA news I want to get to before we can kind of wrap things up. Um, obviously, came out this morning. Had been rumored, speculated for a while. I honestly didn't think it would happen just because you done paid the man $80 million. <laughs> There's no way you give up on him this fast. But the Detroit Pistons fired Monty Williams and will be absorbing the remaining $65 million on his contract after just one season where they set the single season NBA record for a losing streak and came, I believe it was one or two games shy of the longest losing streak ever. Um, which is still uh, held by the process 76ers was spanned between two seasons. Uh, Detroit is in a <laughs> absolutely horrible spot. Um, what do you, <laughs> just to start here, what do you think about their decision to can Monty after just one year, after giving him literally one of the largest coaching contracts in NBA history? I think it was doomed from the start. Monty didn't want to coach. He wanted to take a year off. Uh, he had obviously a really tough last uh, in Phoenix, he had some things in his personal life, I know as well, um, that was the reason why he didn't want to coach. He wanted to take a year off. And it's it's uh, was, it's like, um, what's the word? Not ironic, but it's very easy to say you can't be in it for the money. You know what I mean? Like everyone says, mm -hmm. you're not in it for the money. You have to because you love it. But I feel like Monty signed this contract because of the money. Because Detroit said, we will reset the market from a coaching perspective in terms of your salary, salary, we're going to give you the biggest contract of all time. And for Monty Williams, it's like, damn, like I already know I could suck and get fired as he actually did and still get this $70 million or whatever the contract was. Right. Yeah. So I think from the start, it was just a really bad spot to be in when you basically have to say, tell the coach, like, listen, I know you don't want to coach here. I know your heart's not in it, but we'll just give you all of the money you could possibly want. So you can't say no. From that perspective, it's really hard to build a coaching staff relationship with the players. And I mean, you're, you're literally a coach of a team like you have to lead all of these people. And if your heart's not in it, it's going to be really difficult to do that. So yeah. on top of that, Detroit being one of the worst teams we have seen in recent memory, losing the 20 whatever games in a row they did, not being competitive for a majority of the season. And 
it's not like we were expecting Detroit to be historically bad this year. Like the yes. expectation wasn't them to make the play in. It wasn't them to make the playoffs. I'm not getting crazy, mm-hmm. but it was not to be like, just the absolute bottom worst team in the NBA this year. That was also not in the cards. Like we needed a little bit something better than that. So I even think he underachieved in that aspect. And then just the team never really gelled. Like I feel like you never got the most out of Cade out of Ivy. Like these young players that have potential, a lot of work to do, but have potential. I feel like we just didn't really see the best out of them too. So it was hard to come away from this season and really feel good about the Monty Williams hiring. Now, to be fair, there's not a ton of options out there on the market. You know, at this point, why they even kept him for the next, the last two months, like you could have fired him when the season was over. You could have done interviews. You could have kind of get ahead of the curve, but now you right. waited and you're kind of behind the ball now because everyone who would have got fired already got fired and they've been interviewing people. So yeah. I think that was another, you know, kind of failure by the Detroit Pistons. Um, but it's just, it's going to be hard because the team's in the tough spot. You know, like I'm high on Kate. I think he'd be something, but, Got to show it at some point. He's due like $250 million. And there's just not a lot of pieces on this team that I'm just so confident in. Like, I like Jalen Duran. I like Asar. I like Ivy. They all have certain things that they do. They do well and have potential to do in the future. But it's hard when your whole team is just young guys. And none of them really have stood out drastically over the other, like Paulo has with the Magic, for example. So, doing from, but I do think it was the right move because his heart just never was in it. Yeah, I'm I'm almost always a guy that is going to side with you should never in almost any circumstance be firing a coach after their first season just because it's that's that feels like such an impossible task for them to get everything set up the way they want to or produce any type of great results um after their first season. This probably falls in one of the very few buckets where I would have to say I I I can see it at least. Um mostly because exactly like you said Coming into this year, there wasn't an expectation for the Pistons to be great, but why are we even talking about them in the same conversation as the process Sixers? They were trying to lose. Like you have Kate already, like you mentioned, they have uh Jalen Duran, they drafted a SAR. You've got a guy like you know Jaden Ivey as well, who Monty Williams is having come off the bench for parts of the season. Like there were decent players on this roster, young, but good players and we're seeing what some of these other young stars to your point around the league are doing and even some of these completely young teams we talked about the magic already out here getting all their way into the five seed in the same conference and the Pistons are losing 27 games in a row no professional sporting team should be losing 27 games in a row I don't care what sport it is I don't care it should not happen at any professional level um, especially not in the NBA and especially not for a team like the Pistons that has the level of, again, young talent, but talent nonetheless that they do. Um, So I I definitely understand the move, but you bring up a great point that it is, it's late. There are guys who are, um, you know, could have been interviewed and potentially persuaded to become the Pistons head coach. I know it's a hard sell (laughs) with their their current situation, but um, at the end of the day, like you said, they're definitely behind the curve um, in starting their search. Um, it's going to be interesting what they do. This is going to be Cade's what third coach now in just three seasons, um, which is never a good setup. Um, we've seen it happen. And I think it's more prevalent in a sport like football, especially when you have like a quarterback, you just yeah. has that constant cycle of coaches. You just can never get fully comfortable and really see what they can be when there's always constant turnover and you're getting told and taught different things. Um, so I, I feel for him on that aspect. I agree with you. I, I'm a big Cade fan. I think that um, he definitely has the potential to pan out to be a guy in this league. Um, I really like Asar. I think he's already obviously proved to be one of the better defenders in the NBA. Um, and he's another guy who, if the offense even comes around just a little bit, he doesn't have to ever become this crazy knockdown shooter or have this ridiculous you know, self-creation. But if he can just be – decent on the offensive side of the ball what you're getting from him defensively already um is massive so yeah i I think that the pistons are i don't know i don't know where they go from a a coaching search perspective because it's going to be a tough ass to have anybody come into this roster um and want to do it and especially now you already done tied up almost 70 million still left to have to pay money um i imagine there's got to be some level of of cap that they have available that they 
or, or for a coach that they don't now have at their disposal because they're already paying so much with yeah. Tony Williams. So it's a tough, tough scene um, in Detroit. Um, with coaching specifically, too, I do want to get your thoughts, though, on the uh, the Lakers head coaching vacancy. I wish Dame could have made it today because he is a Lakers fan, and we've talked a bit about um, his thoughts with J.J. Redick potentially being the the option for them as a head coach. Uh, both him and I are really in agreement that, and it's nothing against J.J. as a you know as a basketball mind. It's clear that he's one of the highest basketball IQ guys. Um, but I said, who I asked him, I was like, do you remember who the last coach to go from zero professional coaching experience to head coach was? And it was Steve Nash in Brooklyn. And that was a dumpster fire. (laughs) And with all due respect, the Lakers organization is going to be held to even a higher standard. Their fan base has even higher expectations. Why even put yourself in that position? JJ Reddick could pan out to be a great NBA coach. This just seems like a setup for this to be his first job. If he was going to take a Pistons job or a Hornets job, great. You're going to have such a long leash. There's no expectations. Like, you can really learn on the job. You can't learn on the job with the Lakers. They're not going to stand for that. Um, but I, I want to ask you, what do you think – what do you what do you think it would mean for the Lakers if it does end up being J.J. Redick as their, their head coach moving forward? It's tough because I think everyone expects it to be JJ at this point. And if they don't get JJ, it'll be looked at as a letdown, even though a guy like James Rago, who has been interviewed a lot, um, has more experience and has had mm-hmm. some success, although not a ton with Charlotte, but, you know, it did right. have a top, uh, top offense. They were able to make the play in uh, and they were just terrible. That's wanted to happen. I think from just a perspective, it's the most interesting storyline in the off season. Like Paul George signing cool, like a couple trades out here cool, but like there's really not a huge marquee like trade piece, free agent, and uh, NBA prospect that like I have my eyes on. This is like the biggest thing for me this offseason if JJ Reddick gets the Lakers job because I think it's just, I think it's going to be fascinating. I mean, you have them start of a podcast, first of all, kind of hilarious, right? right. You end up being a podcast and then two months later, you end up being the head coach of the team. But I also want to see how he translates because. To me, like he's one of the best, if not the best media person we have right now in the podcast mm-hmm. world, uh, just like analysts on TV. To, in my opinion, he's the best because he really doesn't have a lot of biases. Like he does not feel a specific way or he does not feel like he has to push an agenda. I feel right. like he does a lot of his things just very black and white. He comes with numbers. He comes with proof to back up his statements. And he's also just a really ba- a smart basketball mind. Like he's having these conversations with LeBron James drawing up plays, talking about schemes, talking about different ways how you would impact other players or how you how you handle certain moments in the playoffs and in the finals. It's obvious the knowledge is there, but it's also completely different when you have to take that knowledge and take it to a team that has to win now, that has to compete for a championship now, that has LeBron James and Anthony Davis under contract, who your expectation is at bare minimum, we got to win a couple playoff series and get back to the WCF. You know, if they're able to go to WCF and maybe they face uh, OKC or Dallas or, or Denver again, if they're able to take it to six or seven games, I think a lot of Lakers fans are saying, hey, that's an improvement that we've got over the last couple of seasons because he's going to be given an unfair expectation. This Lakers team, I just don't think it can compete for a championship. I think when you sack it up with the rest of the West, they might have the star power in LeBron mm-hmm. and AD, but I also feel like we've seen the last couple of years, age is kind of catching up to LeBron. I feel like defensively, he's nowhere near as locked in as he once no. was. And then offensively, like we saw, I think specifically in that uh, uh, the Denver series two years ago, second half is just not the same as it was in the first half. Like he has all the energy and all of the 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 uh, you know ability to score and everything in the first half, and then in the second half, the energy kind of fades away. The aggressiveness isn't there as much. Maybe you're selling for a couple more jumpers now instead of getting to the rim. So on top of that, not having a great supporting cast. First time head coach, aging star on the older side, Anthony Davis, who has been able to stay healthy, but of course has an injury history. All of these expectations to win a championship, but when you break it down on the actual roster, not a roster that's going to win a championship, in my opinion. So you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. It's your first time getting a head coaching job. If you fail as a Lakers coach, fair or not, you're going to be looked at differently. If -hmm. you're not able to win a playoff series, if you miss the playoffs, God forbid, you're going to be looked at differently if they end up firing you two to three years from now. 
Yeah, and I think they already have set a precedent with such short leashes given to Darvin Ham. I, I would say, I, fair or unfair all or not. Vocal, all, honestly, all since Phil Jackson, everyone yeah. has a short leash. Right. Frank Vogel brought them a ring, and a year later is canned. Like, there is not the leeway given for that franchise, you know, right or wrong. That's just the reality of the situation. Um, if he is hired, no way they keep the podcast going, right? No way, no way. Can't. Okay. <laughs> right. Can't. That would be insane after a loss. So, so, I got you in the pod later, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> if they were able to somehow pull that off, it would be must watch. Must watch oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, they haven't dropped an episode in like three weeks. They, they haven't, which is making Instagram it... like no episode this week. Stay tuned. No episode this week. Stay tuned. Yeah. It's like, damn, bro, just don't post it. Like, I know it doesn't have to come out. Right. It, it makes me feel like he's got to be getting the head coaching job. Right. There's no way. There's something going on behind the scenes there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, super super injured for the Lakers. Um. You definitely said it. Since Phil Jackson, uh, I think they've had six coaches. None of them have lasted more than. Two or three, I think three seasons is the most. Yeah, I think Vogel had three years. Yeah. Um, so it's and honestly definitely. Vogel got fired because they got hurt. Like in the Sun series, they got injured. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, the unfair expectations, but look, that's what comes when you play in these big markets like New York or, or LA. Um, so it, it comes with the territory. So I I think them missing out on Dan Hurley. I know I, Dane specifically messaged me after the, the tweet broke out that, that Hurley was going to go back to UConn, um, and he was hurt. I know Lakers fans were hurt because that <laughs> was almost like the savior to them signing LeBron's yeah. podcast co-host as their, their head coach. Um, 2024, man. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, with that, though, I want to get into the last thing that we're going to do in the episode. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, the draft is around the corner. Um, me and Dame did this uh, a couple of episodes ago where we kind of went through the Ringer's old draft guides. Um, and I gave him the player comps and had him try to guess the player based off of the player comps. I use the Ringer's because they have some wild ones up there. I don't know if you've ever really <laughs> given, uh, dug into some of them. That they have some crazy, crazy stuff. Somebody's was like Ben's a, a shorter, or no, it was Ben Simmons with a jumper. And I was like, that's not how you can even say Ben Simmons. That's like the defining feature of him. Um, so again, with the draft around the corner, one to, to go back and get some more of these off because they, they did really well on Instagram and TikTok, fancy to like it. So um, want to throw these at you. Um, gonna I have three different draft guides pulled up. Uh, I have the 2021 or the 2020 draft guide, the 2019 draft guide, and then um, keeping it in line with the Celtics. I do have the 2017 draft guide, which is the Tatum draft. Um, so I'll start. I'll start with 2020 and work my way back. Going to do just a couple here uh, to kind of wrap up the episode. So let me go ahead and find a good one here. Okay. Uh, so the first player I have for you. It says shades of Shea Gilgis Alexander and Sam Cassell. This is the the 2020 draft. I'm so bad with draft classes. If I'm being honest, the 2020 draft shades this of is, SGA, but this is 2020 SGA. So this isn't superstar SGA. Obviously, yeah, this is the Anthony Edwards, Lamelo Ball, James Wiseman year. Um, so it's obviously a guard. Shades of so I'm just thinking smooth. Sam kind of throws me off. Yeah, the little uh, little write up says genius playmaker who can be a major building block of a contending team. Is it Lamelo? It's not Lamelo. Um, what other guards are in that class? Now I'm just thinking of yeah, who got drafted. Um, it's funny because Lamelo's uh, his says shades of Lonzo. <laughs> yeah, like the Europeans. Why don't brother? Um, twenty twenty draft class. Let me see. So this is Halliburton. It is Halliburton. Oh, okay, that that makes sense. Yeah, Sam Cassell. Interesting. I, I guess the build, the SGA build though makes sense. That is fair. Yeah, you get the tall, lengthy guard. Um, yeah, yeah. He they actually had him as the. I think Kevin O'Connor does all of these. He had him as the ninth ranked player. Um, in the class, um, scroll down and find another good one here. 
Um, uh, this next guy says shades of Alex Caruso, Malcolm Brogdon, and Lamar Patterson. Um, the little excerpt okay, says, Okay, so defender. <laughs> <laughs> right. The excerpt says high IQ guard who plays hard, already has a veteran skill set, and projects favorably as a rotation player. Hmm. What what was the names again? It was uh Caruso, Caruso, Malcolm Brogdon, and Lamar Patterson. Okay, so it's a guard defensive minded. Mm-hmm. Uh unless it's like a coro is in that draft, right? Yeah, it's not a coro though. It's just defensive minded. Um is it a guard? It is a guard. Was this a later round pick or earlier, like top 15, bottom 15? Late, later in the, the first round. I don't remember what his okay. exact spot spot was. But I'm pretty sure he was like late teens or early 20s off the top of my head. Hmm. Yeah, he These was. are tough, man. Where is it? Oh no! I'm, yeah, I'm tripping. He was the the last pick in the first round. If you remember this draft, actually, it was a Celtics draft pick. Twenty. We traded this. Yeah, Desmond Bain. It is Desmond <laughs> Bain. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy to see somebody's wingspan be shorter than their height on the. Yeah, no, and you like. Board. I feel like a lot of times you don't notice wingspan. Desmond Bain, you notice his wingspan. It's he crazy. G- he genuinely looks like all the sharpshooters on like 2K17 where you had to minimize your yeah. wingspan to get the extra <laughs> three-point attributes. Uh, let me see if there's any other good ones in here. I know we did some of the 2021s last time. I don't want to overlap. Um, let me see. Oh, here's, here's another interesting one. Um, <laughs> this one has shades of Amari Stoudemire, Kyle Kuzma, and it says bouncy Marcus Morris. Um, Damn. His yeah, his his little write up says pure athlete who runs the floor with grace and jumps with explosive power. That's an interesting comp. I mean, uh, first of all, Mari's crazy. Like right. you giving Amari with just like insane athleticism. Um, this is still 2020. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's a big. That would make it a lot is, of yeah, sense. Yeah, it's a big. Yeah. Uh, 2020 drafts. So. Who else is in that class? Like, Maxi was in that class. Yeah. Uh, like, IQ. This sounds like a guy that would go high, though. This sounds like a guy that's, like, a top 10, 15 pick. If this he, is he, he, was a, he was a top 10 pick. Um, Was he a bust? Is this someone that I'm just going to, like, think of that didn't pan out? Uh, they're not on the team that drafted them. Uh, But I wouldn't say he's a bust. Okay, so it was – sorry, it was Amari. T- tell me the comp again. It was uh, Amari, Kyle Kuzma, and then it says bouncy Marcus Morris. Um, I'm just trying to think who's in that draft. So someone just insane athleticism. Yeah. This is Anthony Edwards, Wiseman, LaMelo, Patrick Williams. Oh, um, oh, you know. this is Halliburton's draft. Uh, is it Obi? It is Obi Toppin. Yes, because I remember yeah. Knicks fans are like, oh, shit, like, why didn't we draft Halliburton? Facts, facts. Yeah. Um, to be fair, bro, at Dayton, he was super bouncy. I mean, he still is obviously super bouncy yeah. in the NBA, but he was he was doing East Bay's. I, I, I to be fair, he still does East Bay's in game. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Then they add these adjectives on the players. It's funny, like bouncy Marcus. Um, the Mari shit is crazy. Yeah, I did. I don't see that at all. Um, let, all right, let's get off of this one because I know we did a lot of the big ones the last time. Um, let me go to the 2019 draft class. Um, this is the Zion and Ja draft class. Okay. First person I have, let me find another good one here. <laughs> we did this one last time, but it was so funny that I want to do it again. Uh, this one says shades of Paul George, Richard Lewis, and then bigger Ben McLemore. What the hell? Uh, <laughs> to get Paul George and then bigger Ben Malcolm. Who is the second player? Um, it's Rashard Lewis. Okay, and he so he I mean, was a he was a top ten draft pick this year. 
Zion, Ja, RJ. Yeah. Uh, who else is in this? This is same year as uh, DeAndre Hunter, uh, Jared mm-hmm. Culver, Kobe White, Garland. Louis. Okay. Yep. Uh, oh, is this um? Hmm. I thought I had it, but I don't think I do. I think if I, I oh, with uh, bigger Paul Paul George. Is this one of Ribs guys? I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> is this Cam Reddish? It is Cam Reddish. <laughs> I, to be fair, I've been a Cam Reddish guy for the longest, but I think I have to officially turn my my support. Yeah, in. the Paul George that was always his comp. It was yeah. it was always Paul George. He was really smooth, but yeah, he just did not work out. Yeah, he shows those flashes at times, and it's like it just. I, I wish it could pan out, but. Yeah, we're just reaching the point now where it's like I don't know how many more chances you're gonna get. Um, let's see if I can find another good one here. Um, <laughs> this one is crazy. Shades of Jalen Rose, Harrison Barnes, Rudy Gay, and then it just says Alpha Andrew Wiggins. I, I really don't know what that means, but it's a wild yeah, dig. So a wing. <laughs> uh, is this the Rui comp? Is Rui in this draft? This is this is the same draft as Rui, but this is not Rui. Like I feel Rui's like he's complex. Rui's like, is hilarious. Complex. I'll tell you Rui's after this. <laughs> um, tell me the players again. It was who was who? Rashard Lewis. Uh, this one is it's Jalen Rose, Harrison Barnes, Rudy Gay, and then Alpha Andrew oh, Wiggins. I just I just made it for Rashard Lewis. Uh, Rudy Gay. So someone who could like handle, mm-hmm. uh, but like he's a bigger player. Um, the little write-up says physically gifted scorer who's one at every level, but needs to sharpen his raw skills to flourish in the pros. One at every. So did he go to like a, a big college? I'm assuming. Yeah, he went to a blue blood. Okay. Uh, who else is in this draft? I, I'm asking you, like you would like you <laughs> give me the answer. Uh, uh, this is the, just going draft. It's like all time. I could just throw out names and be like, ah, uh, uh, but yeah. This is the Zion, Ja, RJ, DeAndre Hunter, and, and Darius Garland is the, the top five. Cam Reddish. So uh, who else? Was there any other Duke players? Like, obviously, you had fucking Zion. Uh, mm-hmm. You had RJ, Cam. Was there any other Duke? So we got Duke, Kentucky, North Carolina. I'm just blanking on players who were in this draft. <laughs> I'm uh, laughing because it's, <laughs> it's a guy you just named him. It is RJ. <laughs> oh, it's RJ. Yeah. No, I can't. That's a that's a weird comp. Yeah. Alpha Andrew Damn. Wiggins. It, it just feels unnecessary. Andrew Wiggins, I guess, kind of works. And like, I feel like their games now, like low key, I could see it. But yeah, yeah the Rudy get. I guess just offensively, he just never really turned into someone as consistent. Yeah, Rui is wild. We did his last time, um, and it, it took Dame a minute to guess it. Um, his comps are the Morris twins, Jabari Parker, and I kid you not, it says washed Carmelo Anthony. That is so rude. <laughs> Imagine you're a prospect, you're 18 years old, and your your write up is washed Carmelo Anthony. It's like right. damn, it compared to, it gone to the to, league, and I'm cooked. Right, you can't compare to Melo just on the Blazers, though. No, nowhere else. That's, I'd be sick. Yeah, it's kind of disrespectful. Um, let me see if there's any other good ones in here. Um, that's most of these. Right, let's go to the 2017 one. Um, this is the Markel, Lonzo, Tatum, Tatum. De'Aaron, uh, Fox year. Uh, the yeah. first one I have, I guess now they, they – Further back I go, they swapped out from comps. Now all of these, I guess, are best case scenarios. Um, so the first one, it says his best case scenario is Tracy McGrady, Andre Iguodala, or Aaron Gordon. This is the when you first said T Mac, I was thinking, is this like a Donovan Mitchell, maybe? Like just high upside, could score a shit ton. Yeah, uh, not Donovan. The, re- the other comps, yeah, the other comps don't make sense. Um it was T Mac. Who were the others? It's T Mac, Andre Iguodala, and 
Aaron Gordon. This is getting compared to Aaron Gordon in 2017. Yeah. I mean, this has to be like a bigger, probably wing player. Yeah. Uh, is this Josh Jackson? It is Josh Jackson. That's a good pull. <laughs> yeah. It says athletic, yeah. energetic. Because I remember, players. like, he went with him. Uh, and I remember this video uh, when I saw it a couple of weeks ago, maybe. It was just like, an, it might have been on TikTok. It was this Celtics fan saying, uh, or no, it was it was a Suns fan getting excited because the Celtics took Jason Tatum. They're like, good, yeah. I don't want Tatum. I want Josh Jackson. And that should just suck <laughs> with me, yeah. Yeah, that is a horrible miss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, athletic, energetic, two-way forward who's scoring upside is contingent upon the system in which he plays. Did not pan out. <laughs> um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, next one says, best case scenario, Danny Granger, Paul Pierce, and Rudy Gay. A lot of Rudy Gay comps. Danny Granger. Okay, so this is like a three for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Danny Granger, Rudy Gay. This makes me think like mid-range type dude. Um, this wouldn't be like Malik Monk, right? No, it's not Malik Monk. Yeah, he's just too small for those guys. Yeah. Um, what other wings are in this class? Um, um wings you got like i know bam's in this class yeah. uh tatum jonathan isaac uh laurie's in this class og and none of those could really scream all pierce danny granger i'm assuming you're not giving me the names of those players either um i i, I <laughs> it is one of the guys i just listed <laughs> oh shit is it uh yeah. what do you say you said jonathan isaac it's not Isaac wasn't that good offensively. It can't be Isaac. No, Isaac says Marvin Williams and longer Harrison Barnes. So it's not it's not so Lori. Isaac. I get because Lori can shoot. Mm -mm. Damn. Fuck. Now I don't even know who the other people you named is. Uh it's, um who else? We said yeah. Josh Jackson, of course. Yeah. I'm it's Jason Tatum. It's Jason Tatum. It's your boy. Oh, my God. <laughs> I should have seen the Celtics connection. It was right yeah. in front of my face. Uh, that's one of the biggest things I've noticed going through the draft comps is they almost always find a way to make some, like, unreasonably unreasonable connection. If it's like – if you're a lefty, they somehow find a way to pair your game up with yeah. other lefties. Europeans, um, Europeans, white dudes, white dudes, right. brothers, we just found out. It's, it's, right. it's, it's <laughs> all right there. Yeah, I'm looking. Lori's right now. First one, best case scenario was Dirk, which is like, I mean, I tall, no, actually, white, no. right? European. Tall, white, your feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do a couple more here before we get up out of here. Um, see who else is in this draft class. Um, there's some names here for some guys that are not in the league anymore. That's crazy. Um, Semi Ojale. I have not heard that name in a while. I thought he could have been something. Yeah. Um, next one is best case scenario says Shane Battier, Trevor Ariza, and Al Farouk Aminu. Um, his little write up says one of the most moldable prospects in the draft with a skill set that'll undoubtedly draw comparisons to Kawhi Leonard. So I guess you could throw Kawhi okay. on the list. So we too. got defensive line. Is this Isaac? This is not Isaac. I was gonna say he's kind of he's low key kind of turned into that like super good defender, but he also could stretch a little bit. Right. Um, Shane Battier. So I mean, this it sounds like someone is like kind of just role player ish who could yeah. defend. So it, it, someone got drafted later in this first round. Yeah, they, they were a yeah in the in the twenties of the first round. Oh, now I'm really pushing who was in this draft class. Yeah. <laughs> um, to be to be honest, I would say at this point they've probably outperformed all of these comps. Like they've developed way more than I think people were expecting. Yeah, I'm trying to think who was drafted in the 20s, and I just Bam was like 15, 16, but obviously it would have been Bam. Uh, Jared Allen was in this class, I think, right? But it's yeah. obviously not Jared Allen. Um, See an all star? Not an all star. 
He did get uh, moved this season, if that helps, was traded. Got traded. Uh, I mean, the biggest arrows here now, uh, Pascal wasn't this draft. Um, o- o- was OG this draft? It was OG. OG. Yeah, I was just about to say, I'm pretty sure he, he was on that Raptors team that won the ring with Kawhi. Um, that makes it actually, th- those comps have been pretty spot on. I'm not going to lie. Definitely outproduced, but spot on. Yeah. Shane Battier and Trevor Ariza feels like perfect for what he had panned into early. And like he's kind of developed more off the dribble for himself now, where it's like a little bit further than that. The Kawhi comp is closer. He's not, obviously not to that level, but he can produce a bit a bit more yeah. than some of these guys that are more just like catch and shoot three um, and wing defense as well. Um, let me see who, if there's any other good, interesting ones here. Um, all right, here we go. Last one I'll do. Um, this one says best case scenario is Stefan Marbury, Steve Francis, and Jeff T. Okay, so this has to be a Sounds like a high level point guard, like someone who's drafting the top 10 of this draft. Yeah. Was this uh, Marbury Francis? Fultz was just so bouncy that I don't know if that was his. Was it Fultz? It's not Fultz. Fultz had Harden, um, Brandon Roy, and Gilbert Arenas on his. Damn. Yeah. That's um, tough. So who else is in this draft? What other guard? Uh, to, be, to be fair, super bouncy. It's super bouncy. Um, Point card? Yeah. Um, This wouldn't be the Lonzo comp. They would have said something about his playmaking for sure. Or a shot or something. Um, uh, What other guard goes top 10 in this class? Go. He's bounced around a, a bunch now at this point. He's like a he's a backup bench player. Yeah, at this point, but at, early on in his career, he was he was kind of that guy, and then they drafted the guy. Um. So what guards got drafted recently? Like Ja. Uh, East or West? I'm I'm stumped here. I can't think uh, of originally it. was was drafted out west. He is um, out east now. He's bounced. I think he's this got to be fourth team, maybe fifth team that, that he's on now. Currently, okay, but he's he's out mm-hmm. east now, but was drafted to a Western Conference team. So Denver top ten Denver. pick. OKC okay, so would have been like Russ. Uh, what else we got? Russ. Um, Dallas no. It was bad at this time. Like San Antonio, no. It was Dallas. <laughs> it was Dallas. Yeah. Uh, who the hell did Dallas draft? Um, it's not Brunson, obviously, his second round pick. Uh, Let me actually look up his how many teams he's been on now. I think it's got to be four or five at this point. What team? What team was he most on? I can't think. What was right now? He's on the Nets. This is um. This is Dennis Smith Jr. Oh, um, okay, yeah. I was not. I I probably if you gave me even if you would have gave me that hint with the Nets, I don't know if I would have <laughs> thought Dennis Smith. Yeah, as crazy as yeah, that, that feels like so Super long bouncy. ago. But yeah, Dallas to Knicks to Detroit, Portland, Charlotte, Brooklyn. Yeah, six teams. I was under shooting it with four. Yeah, damn. That was tough. Yeah, they, they, that first season in Dallas was special, and then obviously you get Luca to come in and took a, took it. a lot of that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, these are all like these are always funny to go through. I think another good one was NBA Draft.net. They have like crazier ones. Where they'll do like the full write ups on guys. Um, but draft comps always make me laugh, especially look like backwards because um, they they. You're never going to be able to paint it out perfectly. Yeah. Uh, with that, though, that is going to do it for episode 61 of the Off the Glass Dells, bro. I appreciate you for coming on. Uh, sure. If if y'all haven't 
tapped into the Pick Aside podcast. What are you, what are you doing, bro? Go go listen to them. Um, they put out great work. Y'all almost at 400 episodes. I saw, which is I know it's crazy. crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> wow. Uh, that'll be linked in the description. Make sure you you check them out. Show them some love. Um, but yeah, appreciate you again. Um, if you watch, listen to this podcast, be sure to drop a like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Follow us on the socials at Off the Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. And I'm out. Peace.